Good morning to you. For those who are visiting, uh, my name is Daniel Thomas. I'm one of the leaders here at KBC, and we are in the middle of our series on the divine attributes, uh, otherwise known as the attributes of God, the character of God, the characteristics of God. It goes by various theological names. Uh, this here now, I believe, is week two, three, four, five, seven. Uh, seven, yes, there we go. It's week seven of what is ultimately a 20-week uh, series running us through to the end of November on the various attributes of God, the divine attributes. Here this morning, as you see on the screen above, we are examining the omniscience of God. It's a word that I'm seeing some not heads nodding to, which is a good thing. Uh, there are those who have familiarity, but we will work through those uh, in due course. For those who haven't been in, in here in previous weeks, we've been covering, covering a very a variety of uh, complex attributes, the aseity of God, the spirituality of God, the transcendence of God, the imminence of God, the immutability of God, and the perfection of God. And here we arrive at our next one, the omniscience. Naturally, again, to fill those in, these sermons are, of course, exegetical, um, and naturally, by virtue of the actual substance of what we are examining throughout these 20 weeks, they are a bit more topical than our usual expository preaching uh, of going through different books of the scriptures. And so here this morning, we are considering the omniscience of God. Now, what does that word mean? mean, uh, not just generally, but particularly in theological terms. Fortunately, very easy for us to understand. Uh, it's a Latin word, ultimately, uh, from the prefix omni, O-M-N-I, that you see there. Omni meaning all or every, and sciens, S-C-I-E-N-S, -E meaning knowledge or specifically to know, to understand. It's where we get the word science from. You can probably pick that out from the word omniscience. Science meaning knowledge, ultimately from scientia in Latin. Why is it important that we understand that? Well, categorizing and defining our terms and actually understanding what these words mean help us as a medium or as a mechanism for being able to understand the theology of scripture that we examine as we go through these various subjects and, in this case, attributes in a systematic fashion. So to simply understand the concept of the omniscience of God is to understand that he has all knowledge. He knows all things, all knowledge, omniscience. Fairly simple when we render it in that kind of particular fashion. What we'll be doing is examining a number of key scriptures here. We've obviously had a number of them read, uh, Psalm 139 particularly. We just had read to us uh, chapter 46 of the book of Isaiah, which kind of has come up a couple of times by virtue of the fact that it is smack bang in the middle of what is known as the trial of the false gods, kind of Isaiah 40 through to 49 there. And so we'll be examining that scripture as well in part, along with a couple of others that are related to one another and related to those very texts when it comes to this very important attribute of God, the fact that God is omniscient, that he is all-knowing, that he has and possesses in himself all knowledge. You may even be able to think automatically off the top of one's head the various kind of implications and applications that has for us as Christians and indeed for any human being for that matter in this world that he has created. And so those will naturally be arising as well as we go through these various texts. What I might get you to do is turn firstly to Matthew chapter 11. And then we'll be in referencing another passage as well, but certainly in terms of a, a couple of verses there to read in Matthew chapter 11. As you turn there, one of the first and kind of uh, important fundamental and foundational aspects of the omniscience of God that is vital for you to understand is the reality that God is all-knowing of himself, that he has all knowledge of himself and who he is in his deity, in his attributes, in these various things which we are examining. That might seem rather ethereal and abstract, and what on earth does that possibly mean? But we'll cover it here in these, in these verses, as well as another reference we'll be getting from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. If you have a look there in Matthew chapter 11, uh, verses 25 through 27 is what we'll read here. It's the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, 
for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Now, this is naturally quite a deep amount of theology there that's present. It covers a variety of subjects. Of course, it naturally touches upon the sovereignty of God, which we'll be examining, and I think it's about four or five weeks' time, roughly. But here we are told a number of key things. First, on, on the reality of the sovereignty of God, you get that in verse 25, the fact that, that the Father, as Lord of heaven and earth, indeed has hidden these things, the things that Jesus is referencing in Matthew 11, uh, from those who have professed themselves to be wise and of understanding and of great sagacity. But nevertheless, the real kind of crux comes in, in 26 and 27 when it says, and we are told indeed, that no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son has chosen to reveal him. The sovereignty of God, particularly in redemption and salvation, is, is what we're being told there right at the end, um, in that last part of that clause in saying that anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. But we're told one really kind of fundamental fact that that is built upon, namely that no one truly knows the Son except the Father and no one truly knows the Father except the Son. It's speaking to a perfection of knowledge. We examined that, right, in that attribute last week, the fact that God is perfect in all of his attributes. He is not kind of like plotted out on a graph. He is more of one thing than another at a given time, nor is he replacing one attribute with another when he's engaging in certain actions in the world. He is perfect in each individual attribute as well as all of those attributes integrated together at the same time. Thus, he has perfect knowledge in and of himself. The Father is the one who truly knows the Son, the Son the one who truly knows the Father, and the only reason why anyone knows the Father, we're told there, is because the Son has chosen to reveal him to them. All right? It fits quite nicely with statements that Jesus made elsewhere, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He is the door. He is the gate. He is all the various metaphors and symbols and analogies that he uses throughout the Gospels to describe him as being the singular definite article, means, mechanism, medium, and mode by which one comes to God, by which one comes to the Father in this kind of reference. And in that, as a fundamental kind of core principle of that reality, theologically, we are told that no one truly knows the Father except the Son, no one knows the Son except the Father, and anyone else who knows him is only by virtue of the Son having revealed him to them. Does that make sense? Yep. There is an inherent intrinsic perfection of knowledge between the Father and the Son within the Godhead. Now you might go, well, where's the Spirit in that equation? Where's the third person of the Trinity? Well, we're actually told that elsewhere in the New Testament. I'll read it to you, but by the time, I, by the time you turn there, we will have finished referencing it. But the reference comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, wherein the Apostle Paul says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So, therefore, also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God, capital S. Right? Same similar kind of sentiment we just saw there in Matthew 11. And so here, when you consider the whole counsel of Scripture, in this case the New Testament, you get this Trinitarian perfection of knowledge of God within himself. He knows all things about himself and has a perfect knowledge as an inherent characteristic and attribute of his being. Why is that important? Is that mere wax philosophy? Is that mere sophistry? Is that just ethereal, abstract ponderings of the universe? No, fortunately not. It actually has fundamental and foundational implications for how we understand God being omniscient, about him possessing all knowledge. In simple terms, by virtue of the fact that God possesses perfect knowledge in and of himself, that serves as the foundation by which he is then able to have all knowledge of all things. 
namely in a, a good systematic way of kind of categorizing this is in three different forms that god has all knowledge totally so in other words all knowledge of all things he has all knowledge eternity so eternally he has all knowledge eternally that is to say he knows all things past present and future we examined that in part kind of got touched on when we looked at the transcendence of god that he indeed transcends among other things time itself and he also possesses all knowledge intimately so specifically and there's a number of references which might pop into your head and we'll kind of cover those so to work our way through that let's do that in a systematic fashion if you would turn with me to romans chapter 11 So Romans chapter 11, we'll be examining verses 33 to 35. As you turn there, let me just reference a kind of passage which has massive implications of all theological varieties, but also including, uh, but not limited to, the omniscience of God. The Apostle John mentions in his first epistle, so not the Gospel, but the first epistle of John, in chapter 1 he says in verse 5, the beginning thereof, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. A phrase and a statement which is is one of the more popular and well-known of the New Testament. God is light, a statement ontologically of being, and in him there is no darkness at all. Light, going back to ancient times, and we've examined this before as well in various series, light has always, throughout all manner of cultures, been associated intimately and inherently with knowledge and truth, right? being illuminated in one's mind, concept of knowledge and the growth thereof and wisdom and so on. So God being light and in him there being no darkness at all draws a very long list of theological implications, but one of which which is relevant this morning is the fact that indeed if God is light and there is no darkness, no shadow, no hidden thing in him, that communicates to us that he indeed possesses all light, all knowledge of all things. There is nothing that is a shadow to him, that is veiled, that is hidden or dark, that is unknown to him. There is no such concept as darkness when it comes to the supreme deity, to God himself. And so then understanding that basis and that kind of absolute and totalizing claim that God is light and in him is no darkness at all let us examine what we see in romans chapter 11 verses 33 and following we read oh the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of god again already there we have the mentioning of of knowledge and of sophia of wisdom how unsearchable are his judgments how inscrutable are his ways. The concept of the knowledge and the wisdom of God, and including his riches, being unsearchable is not an uncommon theme to the scriptures. Uh, the psalmists mention it various times. It's mentioned across the wisdom literature and other such places throughout the Old Testament. The knowledge of God and everything that he knows, including his ways, his actions, and so on and so forth, which are predicated on that knowledge, They are ultimately unsearchable. They are unknowable in their true, final, and absolute capacity. Okay, we can know things. It's not that we're completely and utterly ignorant, of course. Part of our redemption is indeed having the kind of proverbial scales and blinders of our eyes removed, spiritually speaking, right? And coming to a knowledge of the Lord coming to a knowledge of who he is, coming to a knowledge of his sacrifice, a knowledge of his redemption that is provided for us and on our part. Knowledge is an inherent component of justification and of conversion. It's an inherent component of our ongoing sanctification as Christians, as the Spirit of God works in us to have his own way and to mould us and make us, as we sung earlier, right? And there is a growth and an increase in knowledge. Indeed, the whole purpose of a series such as this is primarily, first and foremost, that we might know God in a deeper and greater degree. The study of who he is is for that very end and very purpose. But indeed, ultimately, and we've encountered this in essentially every single sermon thus far, 
we realise just how quickly we run into the proverbial wall of our finite mortality, so to speak, about the fact that his ways, his knowledge, is unreachable, it is insurpassable, it is insurmountable. We can spend our entire life rigorously studying the scriptures, rigorously examining the theological texts and the historical texts that surround it, going through for decades and decades and decades, for all of one's life. And by the time you reach the end of it, you'll realize that you have not even reached the foothills of the insurmountable and unconquerable mountain that is the knowledge of God. But nevertheless, we see the apostle continuing in saying, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counsellor, who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? What Paul's doing here, and what he's doing more broadly in this section of the end of chapter 11 here, is he's performing, or he's writing what's called a doxology, right? Paul does it at times where he's discussing a very deep theological concept in any given letter, in this case particularly Romans, and essentially, by, by the Spirit, he just launches into a brief, and sometimes not so brief, uh, poetic doxology, Right, which is a kind of a praise um, and a writing and an exclamation and proclamation of praise of God. Doxos meaning uh, worship from the Greek. And so him proclaiming these things, oh, the deep riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. You can kind of see the poetic nature of what's being written. It's interesting him pointing out, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Right, the obvious answer to that rhetorical question being no one. Right? Who has known, truly known, totally known the mind of God? No one. No one except who we were told from Matthew 11, the Son. And from 1 Corinthians, who else? The Spirit. Right? Again, perfect knowledge in and of himself, within the Trinity, within the Godhead. And it's interesting to point out who has been his counsellor. What's a fundamental component of the fact that God has all knowledge? Well, the reality that God has never learnt a thing in his existence. I was about to say life, that doesn't quite work. He's not learnt one single thing in his existence. He has always known all things. Before he ever created even a single atom or molecule, he knew all things about all things. He knew you, he knew you intimately, and he knew you better than you will ever know yourself in an entire lifetime. And he knew all that, before he created anything at all. How does that work? The wall of our finite mortality once more. Again, we'll be examining that particularly when, in, in a little bit later on in the sermon, right? And the fact that God has all knowledge intimately and specifically and referencing and re-exegeting some of what we read earlier from Psalm 139 particularly. But point out here that who has been his counsellor? Rhetorical question, no one. No one has ever had to give him advice about what he should do. No one, he has never turned to any man and said, hmm, do you have any wise counsel, O mortal man, as to what I should do in this preceding action? No. Indeed, he has never had to learn anything. He has never had to sit down and ponder deeply what course of action he may or may not take. He has all knowledge. And his sovereignty, which speaks broadly to his will, his actions, and it, all those various subjects encompassed in that, which we'll examine over the coming weeks, is predicated upon him having all knowledge. That's why we're working through these in a fairly systematic and, and certainly not uh, literally in terms of the scriptures, but intellectually chronological fashion, because all these various attributes feed and flow into the others. Okay? His sovereignty is based and founded upon his omniscience, the fact that he has all knowledge. And so we understand through these kinds of texts, and especially ones as short and pithy as they are, but as powerful and impactful nonetheless, like in 1 John, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. This is the kind of text, and there's many more we could examine, that communicate to us effectively that indeed God has all knowledge totally, 
He has all knowledge about all things. It's fascinating, by the way, just as a very brief aside, that this being who has all knowledge of all things, whose knowledge is transcendent and perfect and etc., etc., has been able to actually communicate with mortals like us and has chosen to do it through human agency, right, through, through humans throughout history and has done so indeed in writing. That's not a fascination with our, it's incredible that God can do that. That's not the fascinating part. It's more the fascinating part that we can understand anything from him at all. That we can comprehend his communication, his actions, and his revealing of his will, his character, his attributes, and so on. It's fascinating that we can conceptualize that, that we can comprehend it, at least even at these kinds of levels, in the first place. It speaks to his power. It speaks to him having all knowledge and the ability therefrom to actually be able to reveal and communicate these things to us with our finite mortal minds. Does that make sense? It's a fascinating thing to ponder and indeed a humbling one most certainly. The second factor to consider here in the omniscience of God is the fact that as I mentioned earlier, God has all knowledge eternally. He has all knowledge throughout all time. Touching in part upon things we've examined before over the previous weeks. But you might, if you would, turn back to Isaiah 46, which was read uh, just before the sermon. In Isaiah chapter 46. The reality of God having knowledge eternally is something that's spoken quite often, uh, spoken about quite often and rather regularly throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah writes about and discusses it at other points in Isaiah. It's mentioned certainly at other points, even in Jeremiah, and so on and so forth throughout the Old Testament. But here in the midst of the trial of the false gods, a very theologically dense and rich section of the scriptures, we find what is quite a poignant uh, and profound uh, exposition of that reality. So in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 8 through 10, we read the following. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Fascinating what we see there, and it should again be fairly obvious even on the surface level. He is God, there is no other, there is none like him, and that goes for all manner of ways and all manner of attributes, not just merely his omniscience, but here God is proclaiming this very concept of his omniscience as one of the infinite list of reasons why there is none like him. And he says that he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. Right? It goes both ways in, in a very classic kind of form of Hebrew parallelism here. Right? He declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. Okay? This is a, a very classic poetic form in the Old Testament and new, but, but especially in the Old Testament, of a description of eternity. Right? From everlasting to everlasting is one of the, uh, I am God is, is one of the passages that we had referenced back in earlier, um, earlier subjects and earlier sermons over this series. Right? This is just one of those many ways in which the Old Testament authors proclaim the eternality of God, in this specific case, his knowledge. He knows the end from the beginning, and indeed from ancient times, he declares things that are not yet even done from our own mortal perspective. Things which to us are future, but to him just simply are. Right? We've explained before in the transcendence of God a couple of weeks ago, just to refresh your memories, there is no such thing as past or present or future for God. He transcends the universe he therefore transcends time, which is an inherent construct of the universe, of his creation. 
And so there simply is. This is why when Moses, among many other reasons, why when Moses asked him what his name is, he says, I am who I am, which can be translated kind of different ways, but I am who I am is generally what we'll end on. I am who I am. Tell them that I am has sent you, because there is no kind of descriptor that is able to be applied to him. There is no legitimate reference that you can make to try and kind of demonstrate who he actually is. He transcends time. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, to quote the Revelation. These are symbolic, these are poetic descriptors of this concept of eternality. And indeed, if he is the one who declares the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, kind of another reference to beginning, he has declared and he has determined things which, from our mortal, finite perspective, have not even been done yet. This is what's demonstrating to us the fact that God has that total knowledge which we saw earlier. He has it eternally. It is not contingent upon time. He does not learn things as time progresses like we do. Man plans for the future all the time. We have in our mind exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, the day after, in the coming week, in the coming month, the coming quarter, the coming year, the coming years, decades even perhaps, who knows? And whilst we often plan, and our plans may very well come to fruition, right? nevertheless, many times they don't. Why? Because we do not have Omniscience. We do not have a knowledge of the future in the specific sense, in, more importantly, a total sense, in a full, complete, comprehensive and perfect sense. We can know elements of the future. We can read the scriptures. We can read the promises of God, of his return. We can read of the resurrection of the dead. We can read various covenantal promises that God has made to us. But those are broad categories that God in his wisdom thankfully knows that we're actually able to wrap our heads around. The specific details of exactly how tomorrow is going to turn out for you, all the way down to the f most finite details of exactly where every single footstep you place will land upon the earth as you walk around tomorrow, you have no knowledge of that. But guess who does? God. And again, to expand our mind to its breaking points, he has known exactly where your footsteps will land tomorrow, and he has known it since before he ever created the universe. Ta-da. Right, we get to a level where it's so obvious and so blatant as to the absolute, again, to use Paul terms, unsearchable grandeur and magnitude and mass and might and depth and height of his knowledge, which is all, which is total and which is eternal in its scope. And again, there's obviously a natural overlap and flow between the omniscience of God and the sovereignty of God. Right? His sovereignty, the sovereignty of his will, the fact that indeed, as we have there, which we get a snapshot of right at the end there, in verse 10, he says, my counsel shall stand, right? and I will accomplish my purpose. Even a cursory reading of the Old Testament, when God is speaking, will indicate to you the rather definitive uh, nature in, with which he speaks. <laughs> okay? You will not find an instance in which God says, to kind of, I suppose, twist and paraphrase that last sentence. If all things pan out well, touch wood, my counsel shall hopefully stand, and I will, if the weather is all right, accomplish my purpose, maybe. Okay? We find no such references. We find absolute, categorical, and definitive language in the way that God speaks to us and to his people particularly. My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. His actions, the fulfillment of his promises, his ways and all the various different subjects we could throw in there are guaranteed and assured 
because of this foundation that God is omniscient. He is not throwing it up in the air and hoping it lands all right when he does a given action, like, say, for example, rescue his people Israel from slavery in Egypt, right, and brings them across the Red Sea and defeats the Pharaoh and his Egyptian army, right, the Exodus. That was not touch and go at any given point. That was a sure thing because God already knew the outcome because indeed he has all knowledge of all things. That plan was never going to go awry. As much and as many times as indeed the Israelites wet the bed and Moses being away for all of about five minutes, they panic and build a golden calf to worship Those are the actions of those who do not have all knowledge, indeed. But this was a sure thing on the part of God. So indeed, then, if this God has all knowledge of all things and he has it eternally, what room, what scope, what crack or crevice may there possibly be for being overwhelmed by fear, by doubt, by anxieties of various kinds when it comes to your life, when it comes to your position and standing before your God? Do you not believe that when he says that he has redeemed his people and that those whom he has, he shall never lose, they shall never slip away, all the Father has given to him, he shall surely keep? Do you have any particular reason for doubting such claim? Do you have any particular reason for thinking that perhaps he was maybe just hoping for the best when he went to the cross? That he was dying in your place as a holy sacrifice, seeing if perhaps he could pull it off at the 11th hour? No. His sacrifice on your behalf was sure and was guaranteed before he ever said, let there be light. And your redemption was secured and paid for before we ever read the words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He has all knowledge and he has it in a way that transcends time. He has it eternally. And so finally then, on the opposite, I suppose, philosophical spectrum to the eternality of this knowledge, we are also to understand, finally, that God possesses all knowledge intimately and specifically, down to the most finite of matters. We get a wonderful exposition of this from that psalm which was read earlier, Psalm 139. So if you would turn there with me, we'll examine essentially verses 1 through 6, and then 13 through to 18. Psalm 139 is one of the more theologically dense and rich of the Psalms, as many of them are, of course, right? not to any exception, but it is popular and renowned for that reality, inherent in its construction and in its writing. And as a Psalm of David, we read... In Psalm 139, beginning in verse 1 through to 6, the following. O Yahweh, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is upon my tongue, Behold, O Yahweh, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is is too wonderful for me. It is high. I, I cannot attain it. Very deep and profound poetic language being employed here on the part of the psalmist David in describing that Yahweh has indeed searched him. He has known him deeply and intimately. He knows when he sits down, when he rises up. 
He knows his comings and his goings. He knows his movements. He knows all of these things. He knows all of these things. He discerns indeed his thoughts from afar. He knows David's own thoughts in this kind of poetic fashion from a distance, pointing to the fact that he knows it without being, in human terms, standing right next to him. That's kind of the analogy being drawn. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Again, this concept of him having all knowledge totally and exhaustively and fully and perfectly. Even, and this is where we get into the element of time, even before a word is upon my tongue, O Yahweh, you know it all together. That's exactly what we've been looking at thus far. Right? He knows it all together. He knows it totally and perfectly. But he knows it even before the words are upon David's lips. And before a word is even upon my tongue, O Yahweh, you know it all together. Yahweh, our God, knows and knew David's thoughts before David ever even thought them. And not only that, did he know David's thoughts before he thought them. He knew David's thoughts before David was ever born, before David ever existed. And not only that, he knew David's thoughts before anything ever existed. Before he even said, let there be light. Before a single atom, particle, quark, molecule, electron, proton, before any of it ever existed. He knew exactly what David's thoughts would be from the moment he was conceived to the day he breathed his last breath and his heart stopped beating. And that goes for you, too. He knew you before you ever existed, and he knew you before anything ever existed. David continues by saying, you hem me in. Right? In other words, you surround me. You, are, you, are, you keep me within where I'm meant to be, within my bounds. Right? Behind and before me. Right? The omnipresence of God. We examined that in essentially kind of a part A, part B, when we examined a couple of weeks ago the transcendence of God and the imminence of God. I-M-M-A, imminent, meaning nearness, God dwelling in and among his creation as well. You lay your hand upon me. And so, of course, naturally David's conclusion is what? In this part in verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. How unsearchable are your ways, O Lord, says the Apostle Paul. It's exactly the same sentiment because whether you're David or whether you are Paul 1,000 years afterwards, or whether you are Daniel, Thomas, 2,000 years after that, the only logical, philosophical, and theological conclusion that one draws when you ponder this subject for any more than about five minutes, how unsearchable, how unattainable, how unconquerable are your ways, your thoughts, your omniscience, O great and most high God. And so we're seeing the grandeur of this knowledge and we're seeing the eternality of this knowledge. What's interesting then to note is as David continues, if you jump forward to verse 13, we'll read the following. In verse 13, David continues by saying, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that verse there obviously is, is quite renowned and quite well known. But you must surely consider what, it, what is actually going on there. Of David describing how God has formed his innermost parts. He knitted him together in his mother's womb. Indeed, he continues by saying, Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame... My constitution, my disposition, my makeup, my frame was not hidden from you. God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. 
when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. That kind of word, that phrase there, depths of the earth, we get from two words in the Hebrew. It's a very classic, ancient, descriptor kind of analogy or symbolism for, for the womb, right? Uh, reminiscent of a seed being planted in the ground and the seed then springing forth as a beautiful flower or tree, right? So he's using symbolism here, using poetic form to describe how indeed his frame, his constitution, his, his construction, how he, was in, how, is, how he was made, who he is as a human being, was not hidden from God, even as he was being made in secret, i.e. in his mother's womb, hidden from the world, protected from the world, nurtured in his mother's womb. He was intricately woven there in that secret place to use the poetic form. Your eyes saw my unformed substance from the moment of conception itself, from the moment in which life begins, which, unfortunately, and in a mind-numbing fashion, we have to, unfortunately, repeat that, yes, indeed, life begins at conception, as if we haven't known that for the history of biology. But indeed, you saw my unformed substance. You saw me when I was a mere zygote, and an embryo, and a fetus, and all that to a baby, right? All the different descriptors for what are nothing more than the stages of human development, the stages of a human being's life, where you are essentially a singular cell that then undergoes division in the womb and all the intricate complexities of exactly how a human being is created and grown and eventually born. All the complexities of biology, all the way down to the genetic level, to the atomic level, to the molecular level, known by God and known intimately by him. For indeed, he is the one who is doing the knitting, to use the, the analogy. He is the one who is knitting him together. And your eyes saw, you had knowledge of me in my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. God knew even before his days had ever begun exactly how, day, how many days David would have. Hence why it's the very same person, along with other writers, who teach us and indeed exhort God to teach us to number our days. Because he is the one who knows them. Before there ever was any days of David, God knew exactly how many there would be. And every one of them were written in his books. He concludes them by saying, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Somehow, by your grace, <laughs> as an addendum that I've added, but notice here again, his conclusion here is what? He essentially launches into the same kind of doxology that Paul did. Because that's the natural conclusion and result of a thorough pondering of the omniscience of God. It leads you inevitably to the end of praise and of worship. Of going, in a literal sense, my God, how great you are. And indeed, he says, how vast is the sum, right? If I were to try and count all of your thoughts, all the things that you know, they would be like the sand running around the world, counting up every single speck and particle of sand on every single beach, in every single land on earth. Good luck. There's a totality and yet a specificity here. You see the grandeur and the eternality of him having knowledge of everything you will ever think, do, say, 
for your entire lifetime and he knows and has known and always will know what that was ever going to be before you ever existed and indeed before anything ever existed. Right, an insurmountable grandeur in the magnitude and scope and yet at the exact same time there is a level of intricacy and specificity all the way down to God knowing the earliest moments of conception in the womb when you, you're essentially undetectable at that point there is a level of specificity which is almost the exact polar opposite on the spectrum of magnitude to the one who knows all things eternally beyond even time itself. Do you understand the scale and see the scope of what we are reading here? This is what it means for God to be omniscient, for him to have all knowledge. That's why we can find throughout the Old and New Testaments Statements like God knowing the number and names of all the stars in the heavens. And yet at the same time, him knowing exactly the number of the hairs on your very head. If we were to sit here and try and conceptualize the amount of stars and planets and so on throughout the universe we would reach that same level of absolute confoundedness and confusion that we do when we try and consider the omniscience of God. All manner of mathematical models and estimates as to how large the universe is. You'll find plenty of models that will say that perhaps there's a hundred billion stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. There's potentially 10 trillion galaxies in the universe. Who knows? We don't. If anything, they're probably an underestimation as opposed to an overestimation. You know what you get when you multiply 100 billion by 10 trillion? A really big number. <laughs> A really big number. Not only does he know the exact number to the one, he has named them all, and he's named them all in a far more poetic fashion, I would imagine, than our heavy dependence on numbers and Greek and Latin words. But yet he also knows all the way down to the finite details of the amount of hairs upon one's head, a number which may or may not be as large as the number of stars in the universe. But nevertheless, you see these polar opposites in this scale and, and scope, right? Not even a sparrow goes a day without his mind being upon it and his eye being upon that sparrow, Jesus tells us, right? The eye seeing, being inter intimately connected, symbolical with knowledge, right? You see, therefore you know, right? This scope, scope and scale of the absolute insurmountable, unsearchable and truly unknowable magnitude of his knowledge also scales all the way down to a level of finite knowledge which we're not even capable of ourselves. All that is how we know and are to understand and to therefore as a basis theologically worship our God in and for his omniscience. And indeed, if this God is omniscient, as we have seen, what reason could we possibly have for not believing him? For not trusting him? For not having confidence? Right? The Latin word confide, con with fide, faith with faith, having confidence in him and in his covenantal promises. If indeed he has promised these things to us, if he has provided the road to redemption and hope 
for ourselves, for our loved ones, and so on. If someone wants to find me a reason why on earth that should not be believed, I'm all ears. Hopefully you don't hold your breath while you're doing it, because you won't be here for long. Is there anyone else whom you should trust more or greater than or to more degree than the omniscient God? Because unlike others in our own time and in our own society, they do not go back on their promises when it becomes inconvenient. You can you should, and from any logical perspective, must, as a matter of necessity, place your only hope, confidence, faith, trust in the one who is omniscient, the one who has all knowledge, totally, eternally, and intimately. The omniscient God. Amen.